Daryl Wanza Serrano. I'm Ariana Ruiz. I'm Renee Rocha. And this is Imagining Latinidades. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, this is Daryl Wanzer Serrano. Uh, I am going to be speaking with a colleague here at the University of Iowa, uh, Lena Murillo. Uh, hello, say hello, Lena. Hi. Uh, Lena is an assistant professor in uh, gender, women, sexuality studies and history, uh, who does work on uh, reproductive justice and the borderlands. Uh, and so we're going to be talking a bit about Lena's uh, current research program uh, and about, you know, the, the same thing that we do anytime we have the, the, the joy of sitting down with someone who is working within the terrain of Latina, Latina, Latinx studies. We want to talk about how she came to this field, what she thinks it offers. And then we're also going to get a chance to hopefully talk a little bit about um, some imagining Latinidade stuff. So uh, that is the plan for today. Uh, this episode is going online a little bit later than we uh, than we anticipated or usually would do. Uh, but Hopefully, it'll still be up in time for uh, for people to listen to it on their normal listening schedules. So, Lena, thank you so much for joining uh, for joining me today and being on the podcast. Absolutely, thank you for having me. Um, Lena has been uh, a member of the Imagining Latinidades working group, uh, attending our kind of regular seminars that we have on campus. In addition to all the, to many of the different events, I know you brought your kids to the film screenings and. Um, it's just been it's been great having you on campus. So this is your third, end, second end year? of my second year. Yeah, end of my second year. I know. I feel like I've been here longer. It's because you're such a fixture already. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing yet, but I do show up a lot. It's it it's a good thing. Is it good? Um, yeah. Well, I, I think, think it's, a it's, good thing. it's a good solidarity thing. I think it's a bad like maybe being disciplined at work thing, <laughs> <laughs> disciplined in research thing. Well, 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 <laughs> well, I do want to get to talking about your research because I know it's a super exciting, um, I know, and we have some students in my home department in communication studies who I know are always eager to take your classes, um, and have you on their committees. Um, but before we do that, I, I would like to start with the kind of like, Latino, Latina, Latinx studies uh, question that we started this podcast with, and we always ask people, um, and that's what we've what we've come to call our Latinx superhero question. <laughs> what is your origin <laughs> story? How did you come to Latina, Latino, Latinx studies as this kind of field? Um, that's a really wonderful question because it allows me to sw- situate myself, I guess, within my own. Um, my own life and biography and connecting my research to my life. So my parents are um, both uh, immigrants from Colombia. Um, They came in the uh, early, uh, I'm sorry, late 1970s. Um, So before really like the war on drugs had gotten started, um, that spurred immigration from Colombia uh, in the 90s. And my father was a pretty radical organizer and just instilled in us this um, idea that um, our education should in some way be connected to fomenting justice. And I um, did not want to go to college for a really long time. And so I think for students, it's really interesting to hear them, um, to hear, you know, for them to hear me say that. You know, I could have gotten a PhD at community college because I was there for so long. And um, but finally, you know, went on and got my BA in history and ethnic studies. And um, it was really the kind of marriage of ethnic studies and history that showed me that that really I could go into academia and also think critically about creating and, and supporting justice. And um, I was always interested in my community Um, as somebody who grew up in a predominantly ethnic Mexican neighborhood. um, All of my parents, friends and comrades were all Chicanos and Chicanas. And I was the only Colombian um, for a long time until the sort of other migration waves came. And so I felt an affinity to um, the Chicanx community in, in San Jose, California is where I grew up. Um, long legacy of, of 
organizing there too, um, with Cesar Chavez and, and Cursillo movements. And so I grew up in that community. So I was, I was always surrounded with um, social justice ideas and, and, and movements. And I wanted to continue to do that in my research. So that's what I've been doing. Cool. Um, just a quick follow up. Like one, one thing that we've heard from uh, from like other peers and from students uh, is that oftentimes when they grow up in like a you know a strong Latino community, for example, uh, they're hesitant to maybe take that first class in ethnic studies or Latino Latino studies, right? Uh, so, what got you to take that first class? Were you like eager to do it? Does somebody have to talk you into it? Like, how did you? Do you remember like how you broke that seal and were like, ah, oh, yeah, this is cool? Um, okay, so I don't remember ever breaking the seal. More than I took classes that I thought were going to be classes that were fun. And I would always pair them up with like my, my actual, like what I considered like career classes. And, um, and my career classes early on were focused on sociology. And it wasn't until I, I finally transferred out of community college and I got, uh, into the foreign four-year institution, which was San Francisco State, and I hated their sociology department, and I felt really isolated, and I sat one day and looked at all my transcripts from the time that I was in community college to when I was at SF State, and I was, I was, I laughed at myself because, one, most of the classes I took for fun, I'm putting those in air quotes, were history classes, and they were all Latina, like Latin American history classes or Latinx Chicano history classes. Mm -hmm. And I was just more of a realization like, okay, so these classes I'm taking for fun are actually the classes that I'm really interested and good at and I enjoy them and they bring me joy. And why don't I do that? Yeah. So that's, that's how that, I don't, so it, I took them as electives, not as classes that I thought would actually um, come to define my career. Yeah. And then it became your major, and yeah. <laughs> then it be, now and it's before you life. know it, you're in grad school, and, and before I know it, I'm in grad school, and now I'm at the University of Iowa, where they're, you know, where this is what I teach every day. Yeah, yeah. Well, so tell me a bit more about um, now about your your research program. Like your, yeah, yes, you teach every day, um, or hopefully not every day, not every um, day. but. What, you know, like, what's the big project that you're working on right now? So I am, uh, and I tell my students this all the time because they say, you know, I have so many ideas. And I'm like, that's really great to have so many ideas. So I have a lot of ideas. Uh -huh. um, and part of my problem is that I put too many, I put time into each one of those ideas, but don't really get them to completion so there, there's a pot, there's many pots. Um, but my main, my main project right now, which is um, finishing my first book, um, I'm looking at the history of women's reproductive health along the U.S.-Mexico border, um, looking at El Paso, Texas as a case study for um, the creation of the first birth control clinic in the borderlands in the 1930s and um, all the way into the 1970s and 80s when you have the creation of uh, Chicana run healthcare clinics mm -hmm. in that region, and really thinking about the ways in which um, health and access to care um, was also connected to population control and immigration controls in the borderlands, and the way that by the 1970s, 60s, and 70s, you really see a counter movement, mostly by Chicanas and, and ethnic Mexican women who. Um, feel that um, that despite um, progressive ideas about health care, these ideas have mostly come through white um, movements that don't really address the plurality of health issues in their community. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, 70 years worth of history about um, to think about the way that women... Um, either as uh, as activists themselves in the late it's in the sixties and seventies, or as as um, as patients um, 
using clinics like the birth control clinic in the 1930s and 40s, um, were always active in movements for health. Um, so it's about reclaiming that history yeah. and addressing uh, the sort of the the negative connections that that history also has to to population control, right? To the history of sterilization, to the racialization of ethnic uh, Latinas bodies as uh, overly fertile, um, mm-hmm. excessive breeders, uh, and that these ideas of the so-called anchor baby um, uh, created in the whatever nineties really have a longer legacy. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so unpacking that, his, that historical legacy and what was your, what was your entry point into this project? Like, how did you, was there like one thing that you found you like and just started eating away at you? Was it a particular like archive that you, that it you was, came across? Like what brought you into this? Yeah? Actually, it was really, I, I went to, Again, I, I never thought of myself as an academic. I just enjoyed history. And um, I traveled a lot when I was younger and worked in all sorts of things from working in construction to restaurant jobs and bartending. And I did that. I did that for most of my life. And I never, never really thought of myself as a serious academic. So when I went to get my PhD, um, when I applied, I only applied to one place. I applied to the Borderlands History Program at the University of Texas, El Paso, because a professor and and the history department at SF State said, hey, Miha, you might be interested in this. You know, because I said, what am I going to do with the history degree when I graduate? I'm an undergrad. What do I know? I guess I'll just go back to bartending. And he said, you know, look at this. This seems like an interesting um, pro- program. And uh, everyone that, <laughs> everyone I told uh, that I, you know, including some of my mentors at SF State, when I mentioned that I was thinking about going to El Paso, they were like, no, what's wrong with you? <laughs> First of all, why would you go to Texas? Like, that was their big thing. Like, do you understand? You live in California. You're going to Texas. Um but to me, it was an adventure. Like, it's just an adventure, and I am interested in looking at the history of women, and I want to know more about women and what's going on. And I was very influenced by the um, discussion around NAFTA and the femicides in Juarez, Ciudad Juarez, which is the sister city to El Paso. And, you know, I said, I'm going to go study the history of women, Latinas, ethnic Mexican women in the border. That's what I want to mm-hmm. do. We'll see what happens. And so when I got to El Paso, everyone said, oh, look at you. So, <laughs> so cute with your ideas of, you know, going to study femicides uh, in Juarez that are not over, mm-hmm. right? Like this is right, something right. that's happening and it's actually quite dangerous and we don't recommend you do this. Choose something else. So um, I spent about a year, you know, just befriending the archivists there at the University of Iowa. I'm, I'm sorry, at the University of Texas, El Paso, and um, uh, making friends with various organizations in the community. And one day um, they closed Planned Parenthood from one day to the next. It was not announced um, that they were going to close the clinics. There were several in the city at the time. Um, and then about a month and a half after that, I got an email from the archivist and said, look, they've given us all of their, um, archives from the 1930s until today. We have all of the Planned Parenthood archives. Is that something that would interest you? (laughs) Like, yeah, (laughs) yes. So I, uh, I spent the next 10 years of my life sitting with those papers and Mm -hmm. traveling to different parts of the country where, um, you know, those papers led me to, to Boston where, you know, all of the Planned Parenthood papers are Margaret Sanger's papers are there. And then the Planned Parenthood Federation of America papers are at uh, Smith, Smith college. Uh So randomly a lot of time in the East coast and, um, and, so it was very, it was by chance, really, and, and making connections with the archivists who felt, I think, somewhat sorry for me that I didn't have a project yet. <laughs> and uh, and it was a fledgling program that the Borderlands History Program, the PhD program was very new. And, and um, so I was one of a cohort of the first, I would say, um, 
students that were coming from outside of Texas to, mm -hmm. to be a part of that. So um, it all just sort of by chance. Yeah. What an exciting time to, it was. to be there and be a part of that. It though. was, it was, it was a hard time too, because that's oh, yeah. exactly actually when the, the, the um, drug wars started. So in some ways my dissertation and my, my book project um, have been in some ways a bit lopsided because I haven't had access to Mexican archives when I was at the height of my researching, um, the UT system shut down all travel to Mexico because there was oh. so much violence. Um, so I'm hoping, you know, barring coronavirus outbreak, mm -hmm. I can go to Mexico this summer and spend some time in the Mexican archives. Good, good luck with that. <laughs> I know. Oh my God. Every time, every time I want to go to Mexico, <laughs> something happens. It's like mass violence, pandemic. Maybe by late this summer. I, you know, I still, I'm, I'm, go, I'm going to go. Like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how, but I'm going to make it work because I think that, I think that that's what makes Borderlands history so exciting. And I think so radical for thinking about the history of Latinx in the United States. Um, and particularly for um, for Chicanx and and I think Mexicans, there is this constant back and forth. Um, the the border in some ways is so porous, despite its militarization, um, despite the violence, right? The history mm -hmm. of violence in the border region. So to write a history about populations and reproduction that doesn't look critically at the history of Mexico and Mexican reproductive health, um, I don't think we'll produce a clear picture. Yeah. Great. <laughs> you do it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah. I mean, I think probably, I think it's probably safe to make plans for like July. I'm going to say July. I need some wood to knock on. So I don't <laughs> think this desk is actually wood. Um, so, uh, is there? I know when I was working on 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 my on my book and 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 my answer to this changed throughout the process. I I always kind of had like a favorite chapter, a favorite case study, a favorite story, and then, like I said, it's it's always shifting and stuff. But is there one that really like? Is there one example or exemplar that jumps out at you that you just like? It's one of the things that really like drives the project for you. Or is it just like all of the things put together that really do it for uh, you? Well, I think I think you 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 um, stated it quite nicely um, at the top there when you said it changed over time, because there are moments where I'm like, "Damn, this is a good like this is going to be a great chapter," and then obviously I'll go, move on to another chapter. I'm like, nah, "There's some really <laughs> good stuff in here." Um, but if I had to say one at this particular moment, that's my fave. I would say um, it's looking through material that um, I worked on uh, for a long time, which was to extrapolate data of the people who were visiting the clinic in the 1960s. So that is right when the birth control pill becomes available. Mm -hmm. And what Planned Parenthood, not just in El Paso, but, um, uh, but in other areas, but I, I still haven't found exactly where else they did this but i but they it was a policy um so after the trials in puerto rico yeah they are still figuring out right the dosages and so they partner with local clinics and one of those is, is el paso to do more test cases and because this um these contraceptives are coming out so quickly Right, they have to they have to take very good care of, you know, who is getting this, and then who came in for this other different type of pill, and who came in for the third one that was produced by that first company. But now they're right, like there there yeah, was yeah. a lot going on, and because I don't have access to the actual clinical records, all I have access to are the meeting minutes for the board of directors. So I developed this like not very nice looking. Um, uh, a sheet of graphs and um, columns and rows and where I'm, you know, I go through, I went through like, you know, 500 documents just looking for 
the numbers of people that were going on and coming off of some of these things. And then every once in a while, they'll mention comments made by patients, which is also like, I'm, I'm not, I don't have access to what yeah. the women are thinking or saying about their experiences with some of these, um, with some of these uh, pharmaceuticals. But every once in a while, it will say something like, well, you know, a group of women have come in with, um, with splotches on their face. And so they are no longer going to be part of hmm. taking this pill. And it's like, so to me, that, that, that chapter is really exciting because finally, um, like I said, my book starts in, in the 1930s. So by the 1960s, I can actually hear, you know, the women, um, even in small, these small spaces talking to their experiences. And the yeah. majority of the women that are using this clinic are overwhelmingly Mexican, um, ethnic Mexican women. And, and for a while there, they're documenting their religion. So I also know that they're overwhelmingly Catholic. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, it, really changes the way one we understand um latina's connection to contraception um and to reproductive health and health care mm -hmm. but it also allows us to understand um the pervasiveness uh of using women's bodies particularly latina's bodies as spaces for um for experimentation yeah so i was going to ask about that so i mean i know that <clears throat> the drug trial process, right, is much different today than yeah. it was in the 1960s. So are these drugs that, like, how much have they gone, what kind of testing have they gone through before they go to, before they went to a market like El Paso, right? Is this like, this just coming off the line and this is essentially the testing or is there, te was there test, I mean, I know there was testing in Puerto Rico for some mm -hmm. of this stuff, um, but yeah, so like, what's the, what was the process to like at what stage in the drugs development were these women being introduced to them? And that's where I need to do a little bit more research because it's not clear from the documents in Planned Parenthood at what point. I do find things, I, I have found sources from um, uh, Maria Calderon, who was the head of the medical committee of the federal Planned Parenthood program, where she's saying, you know, I've, you know, she goes down to El Paso and gives a, several speeches and says, like, I think that this city would be a great place for for these types of uh, for these types of tests. I have found, you know, newspaper clippings that say the FDA has um, okayed this next drug. Right. But like, what is the FDA doing? Right, to, right. I, I at this point, you know, I, I need to sit a little bit more also with with other historians that have been writing for a long time yeah. uh, on the sort of the, those various steps, but in some cases um, very little yeah. uh, was done before it was sent out. Um, and again, this is, you know, the 1960s is a, is a weird time. This is when you have people like Paul Elric who write the population bomb. Yeah. And so there's this, there's this urgency that accompanies the proliferation of these pharmaceuticals yeah. and, and it's all types of people get involved in creating not just, um, not just the pill and different versions of the pill, but also IUDs, you know, uh, spermicidal foams, all sorts of chemicals and things that people are putting inside their bodies, right. um, that have very little, um, that have been tested, um, very little outside of, uh, of some of these going to some of these communities. So mm -hmm. that right now is one of the chapters that I'm just really struck by and, and, um, have, have worked a long time. My, my brother saw some of the, I guess, I, I guess graphs and things that had made. And he was like, did you get that at PhD school? <laughs> and I was like, no, <laughs> no, me and my bad understanding of, uh, of math is going to try to work. <laughs> the statistics of this out um, <laughs> because I mean, that's, you know, that that's, I think it's the data, that kind of data that um, um, really changes the way we understand these things. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Renee and I uh, keep having this conversation. Renee's like a, my good slash bad influence on this question of, of data. Um, 
uh, because he's such a he's such a social scientist, right? He really he's like, is. He's all about the numbers. <laughs> um, yesterday we were meeting, and he has this like he has this apparently the, this this idea that is not just his that like ninety five percent is this magic number of like if you have a ninety five percent probability, it's the word of God. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, um, but but uh, I mean I've been I've been the, uh, kind of like I don't, I don't know if I, I don't know if I'm ready to call it like my pro- a project project or a side project, but running through all all the a bunch of data and part of my role as director of of uh, Latino Latino studies here of trying to figure out like basically like census data and stuff and like how that maps onto admissions and changes in the student demographics at Iowa and changes in programming at Iowa. And, you know, as a, as a, as a committed humanist, right. There's like, there's a, there's a certain point where like you kind of need some numbers, right. Especially I think when you're doing this kind of interdisciplinary sort of, you know, it, it, what I would call interdisciplinary and engaged mm-hmm. scholarship, right. Like you can't be like just bound by one particular disciplinary perspective because that's going to mean that you just can't account for some other stuff that you really have to be able to account for. And so I say that because I feel your pain. <laughs> <laughs> like it's hard to work with numbers when you're not trained to work with numbers, right? No, to make sense out of them. And, yeah. But it's an important it's an important no, thing it's, to do. It's huge. And I think that what it does is it also it adds that level of impact when you, you know, I'm just thinking about one particular um, source that said, you know, one meeting minute, and I can't remember, I think it's like maybe 1963 or 1964, and there's a nurse that writes in through her report. She said, you know, we have lost 85 patients for this particular trial that we're running, but not to worry, there's 319 new patients ready to get on this new drug that we've been given. Mm -hmm. And that to me, it's, I just think of, you know, yes, that data helps illuminate for me sort of in my own imagination, the amount of people that are coming to the clinic. And these are small clinics in El Paso and just um, imagining women having to go on a waiting list. And despite, you know, probably them talking to each other in their neighborhoods and their barrios, like taking this pill, but it's making, you know, these manchas come out on my face and I don't know, but I'm going to go back and try this new thing that they have out. I, it just, it add, you know, I, I can, I can fill in my imagination with thinking about the amount of people that are using these services and what, yeah. and what that means for a community that has been left out of the record of reproductive health. In the larger history of this country, it really, Mm -hmm. you know, the reproductive rights movement has for too long been seen as a white woman's movement, um, a movement that was not of interest to women of color. And I think that that what I'm trying to do with my studies to show that, yes, indeed, you know, women have um, been very much interested in how they they are able to decide when um, to have children and how many and with whom. And um, that that is really important to understand humanity and dignity for Latinas and other communities of color who um, are seen usually as just the guinea pigs for these kinds of things and not necessarily as those who are actually actively going out and searching mm-hmm. for, um, for ways to deal with their own, their own health and well-being. Yeah. So if, if I could kind of pivot us a little bit to, mm-hmm. think, um, to think about about methodology uh, and about disciplinarity a little bit, um, just a, just a little bit. What, what, and I realize, you know, I felt like I was about to defend my dissertation. I'm like, okay, <laughs> well, <laughs> all over again. I'm sorry, I did. No, it's I did, okay. It's not my intention. <laughs> um, but one of the things that 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 we've enjoyed talking with different scholars about is uh, is about the ways in which uh, Latina, Latino, Latinx studies empowers them to ask certain kinds of questions um, and to avoid like pitfalls of kind of uh, more narrower forms of disciplinary thinking. Um, Your experience though is kind of unique because your, your degree is in a borderlands history program, right? I mean, this is already, so like your training, your, your kind of, 
you know, disciplinary preparation is already thoroughly interdisciplinary. Um, how do you think that preparation uh, empowers you to approach these questions that interest you in ways that like maybe uh, you know, a, a, a more, for lack of a better way of putting it, a more conventional historical mm-hmm. training, right? Not to say that you didn't get a, a historical training, but you know what I mean, right? No, like, absolutely. Yeah. And I was also trained by, um, you know, a wonderful Chicano historian who, um, you know, his mantra was like, read widely. Uh, and I think, and, and, and as an undergrad, uh, in ethics studies, I had professors who were not historians, right. Who were teaching, um, various types of, uh, ways to gather information and to, um, to address, um, intellectual gaps, right. Uh, in ways that maybe like sometimes history can't address. So it was like, okay, well, what are these anthropologists talking about? Mm -hmm. Or what are these cultural theorists talking about? Or what are, and so um, I think that what it has allowed me to do is to be able to, um, is to be, is to feel at ease dipping my toe into places that are not my normal fields. You know, I teach in gender and women's studies, which is, you know, radically interdisciplinary. Um, and, uh, I have students who ask me all sorts of questions that I really am not trained to answer, um, in like the formal training of a historian, but because I have, you know, looking at reproductive health, looking at it through the lens of reproductive justice, which is really about bodily autonomy and producing, um, uh, spaces for people to reclaim their bodies and control over their bodies as a human right, it pushes me to look at different literature and to yeah. think about different methods of acquiring information. So one of the things that I did in my own project was to really rely on interviews and oral histories that then, and I really um, enjoy interviewing people. I really enjoy having conversations one on one with people, and so um, I was able to to do work with um, the Borderlands History Blog, where I interviewed a lot of Chicanx historians who had worked on on um, Borderlands um, research, and so I I I thrive on the interdisciplinarity um, that I f- feel like if I didn't have it, I wouldn't be able to do my job as yeah. well, and to be able to do the research that I love so much um, as well if I didn't do that. And I think that that really is about training in ethnic studies and Latino studies um, where you're being asked to sort of weave de- these different fields together and they're and understanding that they have these long literatures right, yeah. that people have been writing about in these different spaces for so long um, and um, and being able to sort of harness them and bring them together and have them talk to each other. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, what's the kind of like a, a, a very jobby kind of follow up to that? <laughs> um, what are what are some things that you think uh, institutions uh, could do or do better at uh, to help empower and support that kind of scholarship that's so committed to interdisciplinarity? Well, mm, that's a tough one. I usually don't think about institutions very much. <laughs> I'm anti-institution. Sure. Um, it's always good to be skeptical of institutions. It, oh, you know, it's healthy. Um, I don't know. I feel like this is a difficult conversation because I'm sort of living it right now. Um, sure. And maybe I can, I can talk through this answer in a way sort of describing the lived experience that I'm like this moment in my, my life as an, as an academic and as a, as a, an instructor, as a teacher, sure. um, I'm teaching two classes. One is the history of Latina, Latino, Latinx immigration. And the other one is the history of social justice movements. Um, they are, they were filled to the brim. In fact, uh, they're capped at 28 students and um, I know some of these students and they know me. And so, of course, they emailed me because um, they were on the wait list. And before I knew it, what, you know, one is uh, at 36 and the other one's at 34. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I am. I'm. Yeah. 
Um, and so I, it's the labor that I think that people that are coming from um, historically marginalized positions where we're trying to open up spaces yeah. in institutions for our voices, for our histories, have to do sometimes as individuals. And it's really wonderful when you can kind of connect your voice to a contingent, right? So to a small group of, of either faculty or students or staff that feel very strongly and committed to these things. But um, I bring up the issue of class size mainly because I think that there is this underlying idea that, you know, we've got the one person that does Latinx studies or that does Latinx this or that, and we're good. Um, and to connect to you know, your earlier comment yeah. about the changing demographics, right? This is, this is an issue at the University of Iowa. The demographics are shifting oh, yeah. and um, uh, pretty quickly. Yeah. And so how is the university going to create um, the spaces for these particular students to thrive? And one of the things that I hear over and over again from my students, um, for instance, the class on Latinx immigration at this moment is 95%. There you go for Renee, 95% <laughs> Latinx. And the students in that class, you know, the first few weeks were shocked to yeah. see themselves in this class together as a contingent. And um, many of them have said, you know, I, my, I'm not majoring in history. I'm majoring in biology or I'm majoring in chemistry or something else. And this is the first time I take a class that makes me feel seen. Yeah. And I feel like had I taken more classes like this, but BTW, many of them are now minoring in Latino studies um, or will be, or will be uh, very soon because they're coming to realize they don't need that many more classes yeah. in order to yeah, get yeah. The, the minor. But, um, but that they need these classes, Not, you know, they're like, I love biology and I love chemistry, but I also feel like it's really taxing on my spirit because yeah. there aren't people like me in those classes. Mm -hmm. And so I guess it's, you know, showing the institution that, that in order for certain communities to make it out of the institution, they need to be seen. And one of the ways that they can be seen is when classes are created that focus on their lived experiences yeah. and treat their lived experiences as important uh, intellectual scholarly fields that matter. Yeah. Yeah. And it's that, and it's that, that component of it, right. That, the, the, that it's an important intellectual scholarly field that we're part, that we're not just part of the community in a kind of like weak sense, but we're part of the like educational mission of the university. Like that's the key part and the role that I think like things that generally fall within Latino, Latino, Latinx studies can play. Um, and you're absolutely right. I mean, this, you know, we see it every semester that the courses that are listed or cross listed under Latino, Latino studies end up having wait lists, oftentimes the size of the course. We yep. just don't have enough. There's so much demand um, that but we just don't have the people to be able to, to teach it. And so, yeah, I mean, I, that's you know, you're totally you've hit like the one of the key issues I think of that we're undergoing at Iowa and that I think other similar sorts of programs are undergoing too. It's like we need more people to be able to effectively do this because it definitely like I'm certain that it holds back the number of people who can declare the minor because if they can't get into that first course, mm -hmm. um, then they're not able to declare right. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, no, it's, and I just came from teaching my uh, immigration class and we watched this really wonderful documentary and many of my students cried and I felt really bad that I made them cry um, after I talked to them about coronavirus. But anyways, um, I had a, a student mention to me as she walked out, she said, you know, this, this documentary is on the Bracero program um, really impacted me not only because I know that there's people in my family that were braceros, but also she works for migrant health. Um, mm -hmm. And she's like the barracks that they showed in this documentary mm -hmm. are the same barracks that I go to work at with 
folks right now. And I think I know who the student I is. Know, I know you do. <laughs> and she just, she was like, I wish I wasn't so upset, but it feels, yeah. I feel this in my bones and the way that they talk about the Bracero program in this documentary and the way that we've been talking about it in class is that, you know, I say, you know, I'm, I'm telling them we can't really understand the history of labor. We can't understand the history of unionizing. We can't understand the history of migration without understanding the history of the Bracero program. Yeah. And, you know, 85% of the students in the class had never heard of it. Yeah. it just not there, you know, never ever. And so what they're, realizing with this class and what they realize with a lot of quote unquote ethnic studies classes is that we can't understand the history of like this country and of democracy and of some of these larger issues without engaging these, yeah, without engaging our community's history. And we can't understand our present moment no, without understanding that absolutely. history either. Like the fact that the, these like weak debates about immigration happen in you know, public discourse today, it always just infuriates me because it's like, oh my gosh, this is so ahistorical. It's just purely ideological and no one knows what they're talking about. And it's not centered on, you know, it's not centered on things that actually happen. Yeah. And uh, students pick up on it very quickly. I had mm-hmm. a student say, you know, I thought, you know, didn't Trump mention something about a guest worker program? I'm like, exactly. You know, like, yes, <laughs> they have been for decades now. And we can see, you know, we have um, tons of projects that have been done around the Brasero program. Uh, in fact, UTEP uh, was at the forefront of chronicling um, a lot of the oral histories that were then used for the Smithsonian um, with braceros, uh, hundreds of bracero oral histories, and you can get many of them online. Mm-hmm. Um, they've been digitized. It's a wonderful resource, I think, for students to understand what that program was like. But we can't have thoughtful conversations and uh, engage in civic life without really understanding the history of, of Latinx in the United States. And um, I do have a couple of, you know, uh, white students in the class who are just their jaws constantly on the floor. And, uh, and the conversations that we're having and, and just the, 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 the actual demographics of the class are just pretty amazing yeah. because I think students are so often used to being, we're in Iowa, they just assume that they're going to be the only or maybe one of two yeah. uh, students, uh, Latinx students, and this has been flipped. So the energy in that class is really yeah. Uh, it's been transformative for me too. Yeah. Not yeah. a class I ever expect, not the demographics in that space did I ever expect to teach a class like that this soon in my uh, career at Iowa. Well, and the other thing that's transformative for them is having you at the front of the classroom, right? I mean, it really, I it, <laughs> it, it makes it, it makes a difference, right? To have someone they can see themselves in, right? And to have you in particular, I've seen you in front of the classroom. You're an awesome teacher. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> Uh, so you know, we, we, we're, I'm we're animated. Start, we're start, we're, I'm animated. I can't, <laughs> I can't, I'm animated. It's true. Um, we're starting to run out of time. Absolutely, and so yeah, uh, no. we're not even going to talk about imagining Latinidades. Sorry. That's fine. Uh, we could, we talk about it all the time on this yeah. show. I mean, it, the show is called imagining <laughs> Latinidades. The next episode, we'll talk about, uh, our, our next, uh, our next You'll event. Fit it in. Um, but I do want to ask you the question that we always ask our guests, which is, um, what advice do you have for a Latinx student at a PWI who maybe doesn't feel like they belong? Um, what's the like one piece of, if you could like take them aside and say, listen to me about this. Like what's that one thing that you would tell them? The one thing I would tell them is to create community wherever they can. Um, I, I get teased a lot. That's why I, when you first, um, said, you know, you go to a lot of the events and a lot of the things. I get teased a lot. I'm getting teased even more. It's getting the the it's getting harsher a little bit. That I do. I love to go to um events on campus. Um particularly those that are with um people that I want to be friends with, regardless of whether they're Latinx or POC or just people that I feel a connection to. Um and I've created community because to me, mm-hmm. that is how I create roots. And it's not just about roots to stay, but it's about roots to be stable, 
right? Um, and to find my bearings in a place that is so different from where I've been used to living, California for most of my life, and then in, in El Paso, Texas, where I was, you know, I was in my Latinx community. Yeah. Um, and so I did what I could to create community here, um, and that has maintained me, and that has fed me. So I say to students out there who feel lonely and alone, um, find find your people, whoever they are. Mm-hmm. Um, find them and build community with them and build solidarity with them. Go to their things. Tell them to go to your things. And, um, and, and just create your family where you are because we need more of you in the struggle doing the work that we're doing now. There's not enough of us as you can, as I, as I plainly (laughs) stated, there's not enough of us. So, um, so stay and, and heal with the people that are around you and that, you know, we're going to take care of you and care for you. Uh, and sometimes you'll find community in strange places, but, but there's community to be made. Well, thank you. What a wonderful, what a wonderful point to end on. Um, thank you so much for joining Absolutely. me today. I know you're thank super you. busy. And no, we're, thank we you for all, taking time out of your all schedule. Are. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Yeah. Uh, to our listeners, we'd love to hear your thoughts um, about the program on Twitter. We're at Imagining Lat for the podcast. Um, or you can shoot us an email at podcast at imaginingletinidades.com. Um, as always, we ask that you please subscribe to the podcast uh, and share it with friends. Uh, and if you're feeling up to it, give us a, a review and a five-star rating on Apple and elsewhere, wherever you happen to listen to podcasts. Um, all that said, thanks for listening. Um, and thank you again for joining me. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Daryl.